everyone. Good evening, you all. How's it going? Come on in. Looking for me outside? Where, where do you think I will be at 7 o'clock? Oh. <laughs> Good evening. I hope you all have had a good week. Thanks for being here tonight as we draw the summer series uh, to, a, to a close. Um, I'll open us up first with a word of prayer, and we'll sing a little bit. And uh, I usually say then I'll introduce our speaker, but of course, we won't be doing that tonight. So uh, bow with me, please, and then we'll, we'll do some, some uh, singing. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us together uh, this evening. Thank you for uh, the week that you've already blessed us with. Thank you for walking with us through the week so far. Father, we ask that you bless this time of fellowship and worship and time in your word. Uh, we ask that it's a blessing to us, an encouragement uh, that lifts us up, to carry us through the rest of this week. Bless those on our bulletin and those um, uh, on our hearts and minds who are struggling and suffering, facing various trials and, and various ways in which, we, uh, in which they especially need you. Uh, right now, we especially want to pray uh, for... The Brumfields and others in the loss of Miss Bonnie, and they go and watch over them tomorrow as the, as the uh, funeral service is tomorrow. Father, thank you for how good you are to us. Thank you for how much you love us. Um, thank you for the gift of your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, as we wrap up the book of James, our theme has been growing wise together. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a moment. But I picked some songs that hopefully will kind of uh, draw out aspects of the book of James. Uh, first is, oh, to be like thee. If we want to grow wise together, there's no better way to grow in wisdom than to be like Christ. So let's sing this together. Oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures, Jesus, thy perfect likeness to wear. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art. Come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thine own image deep on my heart. Oh, to be like of compassion, loving, forgiving, tender and kind, helping the helpless, cheering the fainting, seeking the wandering sinner to find. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, Redeemer, pure as thou art. Thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thine own image deep on my heart. Oh, to be like thee, lowly in spirit, holy and harmless, patient and brave, meekly enduring, cruel reproaches, Willing to suffer, others to save. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art. Come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thine own image deep on my heart. To be like thee, Lord, I am coming now to receive the anointing divine. All that I am and have I am bringing, Lord, from this moment all shall be thine. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer. Pure as thou art, come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thine own image deep on my heart. 
Next song is How Sweet, How Heavenly. This is obviously a song about fellowship. If we want to grow wise together, then appreciating the group effort that goes into that, I think, is appropriate. So let's sing this together. How sweet, how heavenly is the sight when those that love the Lord in one another's peace delight and so fulfill the word when each can feel his brother's sigh and with him bear a part when sorrow flows from eye to eye and joy from heart to heart when free from envy scorn and pride our wishes all above each can his brother's failings hide and show a brother's love when love in one delightful stream through every bosom flows when union sweet and dear esteem in every action glows love is the golden chain that binds the happy souls above and he's an heir of heaven who finds his bosom glow with Love. <clears throat> Last song has been kind of our theme song for the summer, uh, the servant song. So let's sing this together. <clears throat> make me a servant, Lord, make me like you, for you are a servant. Make me one to servant do what you must do to make me a servant make me like you open our hands Lord and teach us to share open Lord, teach us to care. Service to others is service to you. So make us your servants. Make us like you. Okay, well, uh, tonight, of course, we're concluding our summer series uh, on the book of James. And being a, a conclusion type of class, I don't suspect we'll probably be in here too terribly long. We may get finished a little early tonight. Uh, that's a little bit dependent on you, though. I'm, I'm hoping that tonight we'll end with some good discussion as we reflect together on James. So I encourage you to, to be ready to share any thoughts you have. Uh, but we'll probably uh, move a little quickly, be done a little early tonight. But um, we've now spent the past three months in one of the most uh, loved books of the New Testament, uh, but also one of the most challenging. We spent the past three months in the book of James. And like I said uh, at the very beginning in the, the introductory class uh, on this series, James is often called the Proverbs of the New Testament. Um, and if you haven't heard that before, if that's not familiar with you, that's a catchphrase you can store away in your mind and you can always remember that when you think of James. Uh, it's like the Proverbs of the New Testament. And it's like this in a couple of ways. Um, like the Old Testament Proverbs, James is filled with lots of practical instruction for us about what Christian life should look like on the ground, uh, seven days a week in our day-to-day -day living, our day-to-day -day lives, even the most mundane, ordinary things we do, what Christian living should look like and practical instruction for that. And also, like the Old Testament uh, book of Proverbs, James is a book that also challenges us 
with some tough teachings and with some difficult uh, truths at times. James, also like Proverbs here, James really sets the bar high for who we can be and how we should be living um, as followers of Jesus. And that can make it a little bit painful to read sometimes uh, because if we're honest as we read that book and as we think on its teachings and think on our lives, um, I think we all probably have to admit that we fall short in one way or another, uh, in one aspect or, or another, one teaching or another that James uh, gives us. So um, I hope that this series over the summer on James, I hope it's been a real blessing to you. Um, I hope it's done both of the things that James typically does. I hope it has challenged you, while I'll, at the same time, I hope it's also really encouraged you. Um, and, and most of all, I hope that our time in this book has helped us all grow in wisdom. Uh, that's, of course, the theme for the, the summer, and more importantly, that's, I think, the goal of, of the book. Uh, so, again, our theme for the summer has been growing wise together, growing wise together. And that is really, I think, a, a pretty good way to sum up what James set out to do when he wrote this book. He wants those who read it to grow in wisdom, uh, and he doesn't want them to grow just in any kind of wisdom. He doesn't want them to grow in the wisdom of this world, uh, wisdom that James will go on in the book to say is not just earthly, but, but wisdom that is demonic. That's not the kind of wisdom he wants us to grow in. Uh, he wants us to grow in heavenly wisdom. He wants us to grow um, in, in the wisdom that's from God. He wants us to ask God for wisdom. Uh, he wants us to trust that when we do that, that God will give us wisdom. Uh, he wants us to draw near to God and do that with the full assurance and full confidence that when we draw near to God, God will in turn draw near to us. All of those statements are explicitly found in the book of James. These are things he wants us uh, to know. And James doesn't just want us to, to grow wise. He really does want us to do this together. Uh, there are a lot of teachings in the book of James that highlight the uh, communal task of growing in heavenly wisdom. It's not just an individual quest. It really is a, a group quest. This is a journey we are all on together. And so James will talk about how we need one another's physical support. We need one another's support to, to meet various needs that we might have. Uh, we need words of exhortation and words of encouragement from one another. Uh, we need the example of Christ that one person sets. We each need the example of Christ for one another. Uh, we need one another's prayers uh, to grow in wisdom, one another's prayers for when we fall short and when we sin. All of those things are mentioned in one way or another in the book of James. So he really envisions this as a communal task. And so uh, what I want us to do tonight, I just want to remind us of um, everything that James has taught us over the course of this summer and everything that our different uh, speakers have drawn out uh, from the book of James for us. And, and after kind of reminding us of everything that we've done, I, I then want to open up the floor for some uh, discussion on the message of James and, and hopefully some discussion of, of what parts of it especially resonated uh, with you throughout the summer. So first, <clears throat> let's uh, look at where we've been over the course of the summer. And as I do this, if you have your Bible with you tonight, uh, let me encourage you to go ahead and open up to James and just be flipping through the passages as I mention what we've talked about. I think that will help best help refresh your memory for everything that James has, has taught us, everything that our speakers uh, have, have taught us. <clears throat> so we first, in, in just an introductory class, introduced uh, the book of James as a letter written by the half-brother of Jesus, written by James, um, to an audience that seems to consist at least primarily of Jewish Christians. And it, it's a letter that is especially concerned with wisdom. So that we just kind of set the tone that way in the very first class. And then Barrett Kaufman from the Southside congregation, uh, he spoke to us about wisdom, trials, and joy. James talks about rejoicing in the midst of trials because those trials produce steadfastness. They produce uh, endurance and they complete us. Uh, and, and James talks about asking God for wisdom and asking for it without doubting, asking for it in faith. Uh, and if, when we do that, we can rest assured that he will hear us. We can rest assured that he will give wisdom to us. And then Mike Johnson from the um, Richmond congregation he spoke to us about riches, temptations, and gifts. James talks a fairly good deal about wealth 
in this little book. And this is the first reference to wealth that we have. And James warns us here about the temporary nature of wealth, the fleeting nature of wealth. And in that same discussion, in that context of talking about wealth and poverty, um, James also exhorts us, encourages us, um, not just encourage, he commands us to distinguish between um, temptation and gifts. Distinguish between those two because one comes from God and one does not. Temptations never come from God. Gifts always come from God. He says every good and perfect gift is from God. And so we need to discern between those two things. Um, again, specifically while talking about uh, wealth and the resources that we have. And then Jason Salisbury spoke to us about hearing and doing the word of God. Uh, and he especially in his class, I appreciated how he, he focused on how the word of God is like a mirror that will reveal uh, us. It will reveal the state of our hearts. It will reveal what our hearts are really like. And so James exhorts us to not just look in that mirror, but to let that mirror prompt us to take action. Just like when you look in a, a, a real mirror and a physical mirror, hopefully that prompts you to take action if you see something in the mirror that isn't so good. If you realize you've got a bad hair day, you've got something in your teeth or whatever, hopefully it prompts you to action. And, and the Word of God should move us to action in the same way. And then Zach Martin from the Cedar Springs congregation, uh, he spoke to us about James's teaching to show no partiality. Uh, this is a really important teaching. All of James's teachings are important, and all of them really are timeless. But this is something especially that the early church wrestled with. This is something that the 21st century church wrestles with. And this is something that every generation of Christians in between those two times have, have wrestled with. And so James reminds us that if we really take seriously what he calls here the royal law, the, the instruction to love our neighbors as ourselves, if we really take that seriously, then we will not show uh, partiality, to, partiality towards one person or one group in favor over uh, another. And then Brian Egerton from North Lexington, uh, he spoke to us about the relationship between faith and works. Probably the most um, contested passage in the book of James. That relationship, the relationship between faith and works, it can be kind of confusing to us sometimes. And it can especially be confusing to us when we compare what James says about this relationship between faith and works to what Paul says about it, or, or at least a certain interpretation of what Paul says about, uh, about this relationship. But, but James is really quite clear on this issue about how faith and works relate. Um, to James, clearly, true faith is a faith that results in action. It is a faith that moves us to make certain choices and a faith that moves us to not make other uh, certain choices. And so our works are evidence of genuine faith. And James says that faith that, that doesn't have that kind of evidence, faith that doesn't have works, is really a dead faith. And then uh, Dale Hunt spoke to us about watching our words. Uh, he spoke to us about what James calls taming the tongue. Taming the tongue. And this is an especially challenging text in James. Not because it's hard to understand, but because it's just so hard to apply. This is an especially challenging text in James. Uh, James really doesn't hold back. He, he rather strongly reminds us of the great potential for evil, uh, the great potential for devastation that our words have, and how hard it is to rein in our words, how hard it is to control them. And so he challenges us, in light of how hard that is, he challenges us to uh, bring forth blessings, bring forth good things uh, with our words, and not evil things, not destructive things. Uh, and he says it makes no sense for uh, a person's mouth to bring forth both of those things. Just like uh, a spring won't bring forth salt water and fresh, uh, our mouth should not have both evil things and good things coming out of our mouths. It should be good things, healthy things, uh, even though that's a real challenge. And then Nathaniel uh, talked to us about uh, wisdom from above. And so this is a little, a little over halfway through the book of James where we get another explicit reference to wisdom. And this time, James says that there are actually two types of wisdom. There is heavenly wisdom, which is um, characterized by good conduct and meekness, 
gentleness, being open to reason. It's especially characterized by those who seek to make peace uh, among brothers and sisters, those who, who seek to make peace. Uh, and then there's also earthly wisdom. And earthly wisdom is not just earthly. It's really demonic wisdom. It's satanic wisdom. And jealousy and selfish ambition are the two main things that um, characterize this type of earthly wisdom. And, and these things are fatal to peace. Again, the heavenly wisdom will make for peace jealousy and selfish ambition, the things that are the opposite of, of peace. Uh, these things are evil wisdom, uh, earthly wisdom. And then Kurt Montooth from the Holly Hill congregation spoke to us about interpersonal conflict and submitting to God. Um, James, in this passage, James 4, 1 through 12, uh, he sees a close connection between interpersonal conflict and what he calls friendship with the world. That's the way James talks about it. And so the solution to friendship with the world is humble submission to God and drawing near to God. Uh, and when we do this, God will draw near to us. Um, and we will have friendship with God then rather than friendship with the world. And as a result, our relationships will be healthier. They will be stronger. And then Steve Johnson, from, also from North Lexington, he spoke to us about if the Lord wills, or Deo Valenti, uh, if I'm saying that right, from, from Latin, uh, from James 4, 13 through 17. And so in that passage, James reminds us that our lives are brief. Uh, he reminds us that the future is unknown. And because of that, because our lives are brief, because the future is unknown, it's really quite arrogant um, to speak with just great confidence about what we're going to do and uh, what's going to happen to us in the future, what will be the results of what we choose to do. Um, and so the, the wise way to live, the godly way to live, is to recognize instead that really the future is in the Lord's hands. The future is in the Lord's hands. And so we trust him with the future, uh, and we still make our plans, but we make our plans with the recognition that the Lord may have a different plan in mind, uh, and, and we just don't know what that is. And so that, that forces us, when we recognize that, that compels us to walk with humility instead of with uh, arrogance or overconfidence. And then Clay Leonard from Paris Congregation, uh, he spoke to us about waiting for the Lord's coming from James 5, 1 through 12. And Jane, uh, Clay, as he was speaking on this passage, I thought he did a really great job um, contrasting two kinds of hearts that James talks about in this passage, two kinds of hearts. Uh, there are what James calls in this passage fattened hearts. That's what James calls it. Uh, and these fattened hearts have become way too focused on the world and way too focused on possessions. And not only that, they've become so focused on that at the expense of other people. Other people are suffering because of how focused they are on these things. And so the Lord's coming will be a day of judgment for them. I mean, it's a day of judgment for everyone, but it'll be a day of negative judgment uh, for them. And then, so there's, there's, there's those with fattened hearts, and then there are those with fit hearts, is what Clay called it, those who have established their hearts um, in the Lord, and those who are waiting patiently, waiting with endurance for him to come. And, and of course, James really wants us to, to be people with a second kind of heart, people whose hearts are established and, and enduring and looking anxiously for the Lord's coming. And then uh, Bob closed out our uh, our passages in James. He closed out the text of James by speaking about praying in faith. James ends by encouraging us to pray for one another and lean on one another, in, uh, even in confessing our sins to one another. And as we do that, as we're leaning on one another, as we're confessing sins and praying for one another, um, James wants us to trust that prayer has great power because God hears our prayers. God responds to our prayers. Just like he heard and responded to great figures in the past, <clears throat> like Elijah. Um, sorry, I'm going to have to get a drink of water here. But Elijah, if you remember, he prayed. He said there's going to be a drought, and there was a drought. He prayed for rain, and there was rain. God listened to him and responded to him. Uh, and in the same way, it's not because Elijah is just so great and powerful. It's because God is so great and powerful. So if we pray, God, we, can, we can have confidence that God will hear our prayers because prayer is effective. And it's effective because God is so powerful. And so James ends on this note. It ends on this note 
to look out for one another, uh, support one another, support one another spiritually. Um, and again, that reminds us that growing in wisdom is truly a group effort. That's the note that James ends on. So it ends with this idea of growing wise uh, together. And then Robert Murphy uh, from the Summit Congregation in Cincinnati, uh, he was here just last week, and he spoke to us about James and other wisdom. James and other wisdom. Um, Robert, I thought, did a good job drawing out how James is not a book that just stands on its own in the Bible. It's not totally uh, unique. It's actually part of a long tradition reaching back into the Old Testament of books that are concerned first, for, first and foremost with passing on wisdom, imparting wisdom to us. And so books like Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, uh, books like Job, and then parts of other books, books like Leviticus or the Psalms and, and others as well, um, are concerned with passing on wisdom to us. And also, for that matter, Jesus himself. Jesus is someone whose teachings have strongly influenced the book of James. As a few people have talked about over the course of this series the connection between James and the teachings of Jesus, especially the Sermon on the Mount. Um, so even Jesus himself is someone concerned to, to pass on wisdom. So hopefully we take away from that lesson that if we love the book of James, and, and most Christians do, people love the book of James. If we love James, uh, then the good news is James can actually serve as kind of a springboard for us to launch into other parts of the Bible uh, that can give us the same kind of practical teaching, practical instruction um, that James offers us. So that's really where we've been um, over the past three months. And I really have enjoyed this series. I hope you have. I, I especially like that we can look back over the past three months and say that we've covered an entire book of the Bible uh, over this summer. Uh, and we've not just covered it, we've covered it like verse by verse. Each speaker has gone pretty thoroughly through the passage uh, assigned to them. And so if you've been here every week for this series, or if you've been here at least most every week, uh, then hopefully that's something to be proud of. We've looked at a whole book of the Bible together. What a great way to grow wise together, looking at a book like James uh, together. And so what I'd like to do as we wrap this series up, I just want to, to close out with some discussion uh, as we reflect on this book, this really short but also challenging and hopefully uh, encouraging book. So I just want to open up the floor for questions and comments that you might have. Hopefully re this review kind of refreshed everyone on what's in the book of James, what we've done over the summer. So first question I want to ask, uh, what teachings of James, what truths in the book of James did you find especially encouraging to you um, as we worked through this book together? What teachings were especially encouraging to you? I know. Yeah, it's kind of hard to narrow it down. really encouraged me was the fact that James allow us to get out of our comfort zone and to move on to spiritual things. As I was talking in my lesson on praying, uh, that's what the whole book of James is all about, is how we should live, how we should treat one another. And I asked a, a question about um, what we should ponder on. Do we have a prayer life? Mm -hmm. And I guess what really resonates to me and encouraged me the fact that we can move out of our comfort zone, but sometimes God has to change our plans to change his people, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. So I guess that's what encourages me that we can move out of our comfort zone. And uh, Dale talked about uh, how we should use our tongue. Nate talked about wisdom. And as we look at both of those, uh, that would challenge us to move out of our comfort zone and be very encouraging to us when we do move out of our comfort zone, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, so if I'm hearing you right, sounds like what's most encouraging to you is the fact that the book can make us uncomfortable. Uh, the fact that it can push us out of our comfort zone is what's most encouraging to you. That's an that's a interesting and good take, and it's good for us 
to appreciate the value of being pushed out of our comfort zone. If we don't appreciate it, then we'll definitely never move out of our comfort zone. So, go ahead, Cosmo. Well, I didn't really have a comment, but I think Bob wants me to read about the tongue. <laughs> he wants to try to say something to me. <laughs> um, no, that that section of James for me has always been the most challenging. I think mm -hmm. maybe of the whole book. Yeah. Um, I think what I find most interesting, it just as I was looking at the scripture here um, in three eight, it says, "No human being can tame the tongue." Like, yeah. And it says from. Uh, you know, with it we bless our Lord and Father. With it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Yeah. Um, and so he's acknowledging that it's impossible for us to fully be in control of our tongues all the time. I mean, he's acknowledging this is such a hard thing because we do that. We really do. Um, praise God. And then sometimes in the next breath, be tearing each other down or tearing yeah. behind their backs or whatever. Yeah. Um, and that's always been so challenging to me because he's saying it shouldn't be that way. You're made in the image of God. It should not be that way. And he uses the example of nature, saying, like, it's impossible for, you know, a fresh water to have become salty. Like, like, yeah. In nature, these things can't happen. So why... Are we using our tongues this way in a way that yeah. should not ref that does not reflect being made in the image of God? And that's always been really challenging for me because I just really like how he acknowledges how hard it is, mm -hmm. but is saying just stop, like it just mm -hmm. just stop, like it's yeah. not meant to be this way. And so yeah. I just have always really appreciated that. And I know Dale brought out a lot of the um, gossip and the backbiting and how devastating that is really and truly um, and that's something for me that's just something that I have been challenged in my life to to work on a lot and um, so I really appreciated that especially yeah. yeah James on the one hand is like no person can do this you gotta do it <laughs> um, you know, he doesn't he's not like no person can do this so it's okay you just right. realize you're never gonna be able to he, he still calls us to the standard like need to take seriously your words and um, that's it's good that James does that otherwise we wouldn't grow so yeah anybody else what teachings were especially encouraging to you over the course of the summer Barbara so, working off of what uh, Kelsey just said the tongue reveals the heart mm -hmm. and when you catch yourself or others catch you you realize um, what you have to work on. And communication skills is something that's a lifelong effort. And it, changing our heart is a lifelong effort. And you know, hopefully we see early on in our lives that that needs constant growth and maturity. And as we gain control over that, uh, we become better people as well as better Christians as well as a better church yeah yeah James says if you can master your tongue you've mastered your whole body and so yeah even if we never succeed at mastering our tongue fully think of how many other things we will succeed in mastering along the way yeah uh, Doris and then Mary um, I, I re I'll never forget the first time that it really jumped out to me about taming the tongue is when James is talking about like uh, a small a rudder, a small yeah. rudder on the boat steers the yeah. entire boat. Yeah. And that just makes it huge, you know, just yeah. so you got to be aware. But I like James because he, um, he is talking about, he's focusing on the practical Christian daily living yeah. and encouraging Christians to stay strong and in their daily walk um, with Christ and all these different subjects that he brings up here um, are things we face every day yeah yeah and uh, so he's in and with each of those he's just encouraging his believers to be strong and live godly yeah. lives. Yeah, and I'm really grateful. Go ahead and pass it back to Mary. But as it's going, I'm really grateful that 
a book like this is in the Bible because you know, if you're reading through like the historical books of the Old Testament, you know, reading about King David or something or, uh, or things like that, I mean, we're reading great information, great truths, inspiring examples, but, you know, at the same time, we're a great distance removed from that time, and we're a great distance removed from those settings. Like, we're not kings. We're not fighting in these big armies. We're not repelling the Philistines, you know, these types of things. Uh, and so getting a book that is really practical and, like, the day-to-day -day things that we actually face, has uh, it's a great complement to other books of the Bible. Uh, and I love the way that the Bible gives us so many different kinds of things to read. And James is really valuable for this reason. Yeah, go ahead, Mary. I was just thinking about the trials and temptation, and how the patience we're supposed to have. Yeah. And you know, and I remember talking about um, I hope that I remember what you're Oh, our trials, everyday temptations, and how it's, it's preparing us, and, and it tells us to choose joy and to you yeah. know, to be able to wait for the rest of too. And patience is one of the things that I really do not have. I really, I mean, I have to work on it. Yeah, yeah, um, and choosing joy in trials. It's kind of a, a not intuitive way to deal with trials, right? And James begins that way, yeah, by taking joy in those trials because we know what they produce. They produce patience, like you said, Mary. Yeah, and uh, patience can do a world of good for everybody. Let's get the microphone to you, Dale. My mother would have been charged with child abuse <laughs> because she taught us early on if you said the wrong thing you got your mouth washed out with soap <laughs> and it was this lie soap homemade soap but you know in my window <laughs> so near the end of the year she came back in she says that's hell she says I think you'd want it back to use on another student <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh man Daisy did you have your hand up as well Sorry if my voice goes out, I'm still a little hoarse, but um, I love how each one of us have picked something out that we have to work on from this. Yeah. And for me, it's the boasting about tomorrow, because I'm always worried about what the next day is going to bring, and I'm always thinking of what I have to do each day, and so lately I've been stopping myself and saying, tomorrow will wait, yeah. <laughs> worry about today, so yeah. that's what really spoke to me. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Nathaniel. I think you gave uh, some of us a certain passage because it's what we needed to work on. <laughs> That's so, not why I gave you a passage, but <laughs> as I was as I was studying for the lesson that I presented, that there was so much in that uh, in the earthly wisdom section that I was just like, "Ow, yeah. ouch, yeah. ow!" You know that really stings, and it's it's also hard to get up there and present a lesson on it when you know that you are guilty yourself. Yeah. So, um, especially when the very end of that passage says um, that uh, we should not be um, hypocritical. Yeah. You know? So, it's just, it's one of those things where it's like, hey, church, keep me accountable. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Um, you all have kind of anticipated my second question. So I asked you what was the most encouraging text from James. You all told me the most difficult text from James. So that, that's question two. What did you find the most challenging? So I know we've already talked a lot at this. Taming the tongue came up quite a bit. Um, 
boasting about tomorrow, heavenly and earthly wisdom, uh, enduring trials. So I know we've already touched on these things, but anything else from James that you found especially challenging? Uh, Tracy. Uh, the thing that I found, I guess it was an aha moment for me, was in chapter 4 in the first few verses when he says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss mm. that you may spend it on your pleasures. Yeah. It made me stop and think about my prayers and what I'm asking for and if if I'm in line with God's will, yeah. if I'm wanting the right things, or if I'm not, yeah. if it's about me, or is it about what's best, or what is God's will. Yeah, or even wanting the right things, but maybe not always for the right reasons. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And that's, that's a great challenge to all of us, too. Um, that reminded me of a passage in 1 John where it says, we know that we ask anything that is according to his will, he hears us. And hearing there in the context doesn't seem to just mean he listens. It means like he responds the way we're wanting him to respond. Um, and so we put those two passages together, all right? If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. But if we ask amiss, spend our own pleasures, he won't. Or maybe those two things together can remind us, uh, what is God's will is for us uh, to ask things selflessly, uh, being selfless is a key part of God's character, and he's calling us to have the same character when we make requests, and that can be difficult. Yeah. Uh, Barbara. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're in charge of this kingdom now. What do you want? Yeah. And instead of asking for riches and stuff, he asked for wisdom, and God said, because you didn't ask for yourself, I'm going to give you the wisdom, but I'm going to give you all this other yeah. stuff, too. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. It, it's amazing how you can be blessed without having to ask for things. He already knows what you need. And if you so if you ask him for things that are in godly, that are godly and according to his will. Yeah. And what he wants for his people and us. Um, he's willing to give you everything that you need, yeah. and yeah. There's, that you won't be lacking, you'll be lacking nothing. Right. And I appreciated that you drew on King Solomon as an example, the, the paragon of wisdom in the Old Testament. Right. Yeah, embodies this so well. Kelsey. Just one more challenging thing while we're talking about prayer. Um, appreciate what Tracy was talking about, um, but in the prayer of faith towards the end, I think we tend to like to ask each other to pray for us. Oh, you know, I've, I'm sick, or oh, this person that I care about is going through a hard time. Pray for me in that. But this says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And sometimes I think it's very challenging to confess our weaknesses to each other yeah. or to confess to each other things that we might have done that were wrong and ask for prayer. It's yeah. much easier to ask for the, the easier prayer requests, yeah. you know, the ones about yeah. healing and um, things we might feel like we need. So I think a big challenge for us is changing yeah. how we pray for each other and changing how honest we are with each other. Yeah. It's very easy to come to church on a Sunday morning and look your best and yeah. and act as though your life is going great and it's all put together, but how often do we have real conversations with each other and yeah. pray for each other about our spiritual lives or our yeah. weaknesses or our failings? Um, so that's, for me, a very challenging one yeah. um, to remember. Because I struggle just like in my individual prayer life sometimes, but... It sounds like James is saying that we as a church need to be communally praying for each other and together. And I yeah. just don't think that's something we do that often. Yeah, you're right. I mean, so many Sundays at this church and, and churches all around the world, they begin by taking prayer requests. And usually it's prayers about people who are sick, people who have lost loved ones, people who are traveling. Those are all very important prayer requests. I mean, I don't want to take away from those for a moment. But how often... Like we may pray for someone else who's struggling, someone who's lost a loved one or someone who's lost a job or someone who has, you know, something that they're really wrestling with. How often do we raise our hands and say, I'd like to pray, I'd like to ask for prayer for me because I'm really struggling right now, you know. That type of prayer request doesn't happen so much. Uh, the good thing is tonight we have all 
been talking about our weaknesses. So it's not like this type of thing never happens. Uh, and it's so good to cultivate an atmosphere where people feel safe and willing to share those things. Because if we share those things and get shut down, we're not going to share them again. So it's good to, to be in a place where we can share parts of following Jesus, parts of following James that are tough. Yeah, Bob. Yes, I want to leave us something else to ponder on before we go home this afternoon. Do we pray more or less when the sun is shining bright in our lives, when everything is going great versus when we have challenges, challenges in our lives? So I guess the bottom line is when we are having a great time, we, we are blessed. The day has been a fantastic day. Sun is shining, sky is blue, we're ready to go. But when it's cloudy and storming and tornadoes coming in our lives, spiritual lives, or even physical lives, do we pray more then? Yeah. I guess is what I'm asking. Do we pray yeah. those things? Yeah, going back to your passage on prayer, Bob, mm -hmm. I remember how it begins. It says, is anyone, is anyone rejoicing? Is that what it is? Uh, let him sing, right? Anyone suffering, let him pray. Well, you're not just singing, you know, I don't know. You're not singing some random song to yourself like you're humming a tune that you like. It's sing praises to God, right? So in both cases, communication to God. And, and what, how that communication takes take shape will change based on what's going on in our lives. But it's constant communication to God. Yeah. Yeah. Nathaniel. When Jordan Guy was here for homecoming, he did a lesson uh, in the morning Bible class um, that they did the four square thing about finding your purpose. Yeah. I remember he made a comment that was about um, you know, some people have more resources than others because they are, because they have more influence. And so when I'm reading James chapter five, um, where it's talking, it's, it's the fat hearts yeah. um, verse uh, or passage. And uh, it says, you have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. Yeah. Right now we have a very public image of a lot of people with great wealth, uh, people who have resources. To me, it is challenging to watch those people squander their resources on themselves and not towards the kingdom. Yeah. So that's something that challenges me. And then also moving on uh, to the next uh, part of chapter five, um, I think it was also Clay Leonard had this section and he specifically said, uh, talking about farmers, he, I remember he made a comment that said, uh, I've met, he said, I don't know many farmers but all the farmers, I, I had never met a farmer who doesn't believe in God. Yeah, I remember him saying that. And that really hit me because, you know, it, there is a level of faith that you must have when you are growing agriculture. Yeah. I mean, when, when you are depending on, on the rain, you're depending yeah. on good weather, sunlight, you know, everything. You are wholly and totally dependent on God. And you have no control over those things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, both of those things, especially the first one, touches into a big theme in other books devoted to wisdom in the Bible. You said it's a challenge to see people with resources squander it. And that's a challenge that people in James were clearly facing based on what James says. Um, and the Bible talks about how challenging it can be to see the wicked prosper. And people will ask him, like, why does this happen? You know? And uh, James calls us to... Um, to be patient, to be steadfast, to focus on the Lord, depend on Him like a farmer, like you were saying. And that's, that's really the answer in James. It's not, it's not go stop them. It's not go take away their money. It's you be faithful. You know, that's tough. That's very tough. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, um, this third question, I think we probably already touched on this third question too, but um, we focused on what we find most encouraging, what we find most challenging. Um, James, of course, is writing in the first century, 2,000 years ago, a very different world from our own, but he has such an enduring message. And so when you think about the 21st century, when you think about the world we're in, uh, the values, the worldviews that are prominent around us, these types of things, 
And you think about the church living in the 21st century. Right? James is writing to the church living in the 1st century with uh, plenty of values all around Christians that didn't accord with Christ's values. Well, we're in, we're in the 21st century with different things going on, but the basic circumstances are the same in that regard. So what message from James would, do you think the 21st century church especially needs to hear? Maybe parts of James that we might be tempted to ignore or overlook, misinterpret. But in light of our world, what types of things in James do you think are especially mindful for followers of Jesus to keep in mind in, in 2022, in the 21st century? Uh, you've already got the microphone, so we'll go to you and then, then uh, Ron and then Barbara. All of it. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Sums it up well. Go ahead, Ron. I think we need to hear all of it. There you go. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and you know, it's, it's all challenging to me. And uh, I think if we do everything that this book says here, James, we may lack something. You know, what do I lack? You know, I have to ask myself, do I lack this or that or whatever it might be? And there's things that, you know, we'll never be perfect yeah. here on this earth. And the only time we'll be perfect is after we die. And, and then we can't sin no more then. Yeah. Because our sin or committing sin is over with. Yeah. You know, at that time. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's a, it, to me, it's all challenging. I appreciate you saying that um, we all may struggle in different ways, have different weaknesses, because if we're doing this together, let's say that maybe you especially, or I especially, am lacking in uh, patience. Patience was mentioned earlier. Well, someone else may have really great patience. When we're doing this together, you may lean on someone else's patience a little bit when yours is especially being tested, right? Or someone may be really good at controlling their words, and you maybe not so much. Right. Well, focus on them. You know, that's, that's the togetherness of doing this. We can make up for one another's weaknesses in a lot of ways. So, uh, Barbara. Ditto. All right. <laughs> we all agree. We, this whole book is good for the 21st century. But uh, just to, to add to what you were just saying right now, as far as looking to others who have those attributes, my personality is made up of all the people in my life that were a positive influence mm. on me. Yeah. And some negative ones yeah. too, which I try to filter out yeah. through you know the years. I mean, I don't settle for, oh, well, that's okay. I don't have to work on that. Yeah. Um, I'm not, I never settle with, I'm good enough. Yeah. And just every day try to build you know, on um, being better yeah. the next day. And sometimes we fall. You know, sometimes we don't succeed. We're not feeling good. And we just don't yeah. feel like putting that effort in that day. Yeah. And we have to do a little self-care and take care yeah. of ourselves um, and try not to hurt other people yeah. around yeah. us. And, you know, but, um, yeah, it. James' message applies to the church today as much as it did back in the first century. Yeah, yeah. Self-care is so important. Being gracious to ourselves is so important. But sometimes it can get distorted into just settling. And you can't read the book of James and think, yeah, I'm okay. Like, James will push you. And so appreciate you saying that, Barbara. Uh, Bob. Yes, uh, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, Barbara. You're basically saying we need each other. Is that what you're saying? That's right, that's right, yeah. that's right. We need, we need each other. That's right, yeah. it's a team effort. That's Absolutely. great. Absolutely, yeah. Sue. Faith without works is dead. Yeah. And I think, I think we all need to show our faith by our works. Yeah. You can't have one without the other. Yeah, and um, there are... I think a good many Christians in the world who uh, don't have a faith that follows up with works, you know, and so that's a especially timeless teaching from James. Faith without works is dead. Well, I had some things I was going to say on each one of those these questions, but you all said all of them. 
already. So there's nothing I really need to say. Um, thank you all for the discussion tonight. Thank you for reflecting uh, with me on the book of James. Uh, I really enjoyed this series. I hope you did too. hope it was a great blessing to you. Um, next week, I think we will take kind of a, a breather week. We will uh, have, I think, next week a, a week where we'll mostly sing and pray together. Um, and then following week, we will introduce a new series here. Uh, so I'll talk about that some next time. But next week we'll mostly sing and pray and, and just uh, enjoy some fellowship um, together. And then the week after we'll get into a new series. So um, let's pray and uh, our summer series will be wrapped up. So bow with me, please. Thank you, God, for again bringing us together tonight. Thank you for bringing us together over the course of this whole summer as we got to hear different, um, different speakers, some of them ministers, some of them uh, dedicated members of this church, people from various backgrounds, come and all work from your word, all work from the same book, all work from the message that uh, the half-brother of Jesus gave to us. And uh, we ask that you will bless us to internalize the contents of this book, um, that you will bless us as we're challenged by it and sometimes made uncomfortable to embrace that, to realize that is part of growth, that's part of following in the footsteps of your son, and uh, we also ask that you will help us to remember that as we do that, you draw near to us. Uh, that it, while it's true, you set a high standard for us for how to live. You are also infinitely gracious and loving and merciful. And, and you will walk with us in this difficult journey of living like Jesus in a world that doesn't know him. And so in, in the spirit of the whole book of James, and especially in light of what he says at the very beginning, uh, at this moment, we want to ask you for wisdom. We want to ask that you'll give us wisdom. And we ask in faith, without doubting, knowing that you will bestow it on us. Bestow it on each one of us. Bestow it on this church. Uh, and, and grow us to be more like the people you want us to be, who embody the wisdom that's from above. Thank you again for this series. Thank you for tonight. Bless us as we head to our homes. In Jesus' name, amen.